Pirate Borg is a rules-light pirate-themed RPG system building on the popular Merc Borg open license. But where Merc Borg is like a spiked flail to the face of a system, leaving quite the impression but lacking any finesse, Pirate Borg is more of a privateering sloop, fast and agile, but giving you the complete pirate package. So in the 186 page thick core rules, you will find everything you need to run a pirate-themed game in the Dark Caribbean, including 8 character classes, 15 ships, ghosts, skeletons and deep sea abominations, cutlass, pistols, cannons and hats. What I really like are the random generators that help you create ship encounters at sea, derelict ships, treasure maps, uncharted islands, pirates and quests. This book is complete with the sandbox adventure The Curse of Skeleton Point, which gives you a whole island to explore, complete with not one but six dungeons. If this is something that interests you, like and subscribe and let's get into it. Pirate Borg is a comprehensive pirate RPG and the PDF version that I've got may be one of the most complete RPG packages I have ever seen, which actually took me by surprise. Have a look. The Pirate Borg PDF, it has attachments. The Pirate Borg character creation sheet which you can hand out to your players so uh, to help them create the character as well as a colored form fillable character sheet and a printer friendly form fillable character sheet it also came with a player version of the rules that only includes the rules and background information that the players need. So none of the adventurers, none of the monsters. Furthermore, this came with an art package with a JPEG and WebP version of avatars and tokens and just a lot of just a lot of art you can use to show your players can use it in a virtual tabletop or something. But it came also with tokens. Lots and lots of tokens you could print out possibly, put it on your table or of course use them with a virtual tabletop. But there's more. It came with all of the maps separate in both JPEG, PDF and WebP. So you can view them and print them out easily. But there's but there's more. There's a collection of playing cards you can print out that gives you things like monsters, equipment and so on. So already there's a lot of stuff outside of the PDF, but the rules itself are, the PDF especially, are very complete as well. Let's have a look at the index. This index is hyperlinked. So if I press something on the index, it takes me to the corresponding page. And a completely hyperlinked PDF is a very nice thing to have indeed. If you don't have the print version, it makes it very fast to find stuff and navigate this. But let's have a look at the game itself. Pirate Borg builds on the Merc Borg engine, which should be familiar and it's easy to grasp. The entire rules, including naval combat, can be summed up on just these two pages. So I've got five abilities. It's a d20 roll over system. I've got encumbrance rules, very simple with normal sized items, heavier items, small items and stuff. Some rest rule, recover d4, recover d8 and so on. It's a completely player facing system. So players rule to attack, players roll to defend. Armor is damage absorption. 
you've got omens in this case called devil's luck you can use to re-roll and lower damage and stuff you're broken at zero hp and you die below zero hp the rules that pirate borg adds are naval combat especially and a ship is made up of the stats hit points just like character hit points sinks at zero Hull, which is damage absorption, which is armor. Agility is a bonus to maneuvering checks. Speed is how many hexes the ship can move in one round. Skill is for crew skill checks. Broadside is firing the cannons. In this case, it can fire two broadsides at D8 damage. Small arms are all the arms aboard that are not the cannons. They don't do as much damage, but they can fire forwards and backwards all around the ship. Ramming damage, or that should be base ramming damage. If you've moved a few hexes before that, that will be added to the ramming damage. And then the amount of crew that you need to sail the ship and that can be on the ship without it getting too crowded and the capacity for cargo. Furthermore, many ships have specials like this frigate makes two broadsides when over half HP, meaning this two at 18 only if it is over half HP. If it is too damaged, it's down to one broadside. I have a look at the sloop, can travel at full speed when close to the wind. For naval combat, the damage is scaled to ships. So ship AP and damage is not the same as PC, HP and damage. Use a ratio of one to five if you need to convert. So a, uh, a broadside fired at a cannon, D8 cannon would deal D8 times five to a monster like a skeleton or to a PC who's standing in the broadside of a ship. Combat round is 30 seconds instead of 6 and you've got a range and arc of fire, standard range of fire 12 hexes. Ships can only fire their broadside cannons at a 45 degree angle from their side. That is where the small arms comes into play. They can fire fore and aft as well if you don't manage to maneuver the enemy into your broadside firing arc. We've got movement rules. This is to these rules are meant to be played on a tactical hex grid. One inch is 50 feet in this case. Ships can rotate twice during each movement. Initiative D6 plus ship ability on each ship's turn. Captain can use the action to move the ship its speed and hexes. Non-captain PCs take one crew action each. A ship that hasn't taken at least two crew actions can take up to two crew actions total. Switch to close combat rules when appropriate. For example, when you go into boarding. Crew actions include firing the broadside, firing the small arms, full sails, so they can move an extra hex, come about, rotate one extra hex, drop anchor, reduce the ship's speed to zero, weigh anchor, the ship is no longer anchored. Repair the ship. Touching another ship, you can do a boarding party. If the ship ends its movement touching another ship, it can ram that ship. There's some more rules for travel, special skills, cargo repairing, ship repairs and ship upgrades. And we've got optional rules, optional wind rules that modify the speed, the number of hexes a ship can move in a round depending on its position relative to the wind, depending on its direction relative to the wind. As you can see, for Morgburg standards, this is a lot of rules. This is about as many rules for ship combat as you have for regular combat. Maybe even a bit more, especially with the optional rules. But this is about the bare minimum to have tactical pirate ship combat, I think. 
anything less and it just comes down to a broadside slugfest until the HP fall to zero. As it stands, I have not tested this yet, but as it stands, I think this is still pretty much a broadside slugfest. You try to get the enemy into your broadside while maneuvering into their fore or aft so they don't fire their broadside back. And eventually you close in to uh, do a boarding party if you think you can take the enemy in close combat or you maneuver to avoid having a boarding party if you think the enemy has too many soldiers on board. But this is missing a lot of tactical options that would enrich naval combat like firing shrapnel ammunition to damage enemy crew or firing ball and chain to cripple enemy sail and reduce their speed. Also you can't set fire to enemy ships. So while this is quite a lot of rules for Merkborg, I think I would want to have a few more rules to give more possible tactics to ship combat. Anyhow, the setting that Pirate Borg comes with is the Dark Caribbean. So it's historically inspired with real historic places like Havana or Tortuga and real historic players like uh, the British, the West India Company, the French Indies and the Spanish. But besides these uh, historically inspired factions, we've got a lot of fantasy mayhem as well, like the wretched deep ones, leviathans that will bring the end of days, the dark jungles of Yucatan that are full of gold and foul black magic, and of course the undead skeletons, zombies, ghosts. One of the major plot points in Pirate Borg is Ash. The remnants of destroyed undead, first discovered in the Dark Caribbean, known to have psychological and psychedelic effects when consumed, extremely valuable, responsible for numerous conflicts, trade disputes and an influx of black markets. Addicts can be spotted by their sunken eye sockets, darkened lips, and faintly glowing bones. So since the undead appeared, people have started grinding up their bones into a psychedelic drug, and there's an ash black market, and we've got a D20 table of the effects of consuming ash. Some of the effects are really bad, some of them are funny, like you think you're an animal. Some of them are even beneficial. Mental transcendence, permanent plus one to presence. So this drug is not only a good plunder, good reward when you defeat undead opponents, but it is also driving the plot and it will be something that the characters will consume probably for the fun of it and for the possibility of those sweet, sweet bonuses. In the vein of Merkborg, this also has something akin to the calendar of Necrobil. This is the general history of the Dark Caribbean. You can roll on this table what happens, or you can use these in order to give you a timeline for a possible campaign, like Spanish and English are at war. Nassau is sacked, the Republic of Pirates is established, the region's first true democracy, and eventually it ends with a maelstrom forms around the abyss, earthquakes, islands crumble into the sea, and in armor get on. When creating a player character, you've got this handy character creation sheet 
that gives you uh, the scores after rolling your d666 for abilities. It helps you choose a class like the landlubber, no class, or one of the six, maybe eight classes. This game comes with six optional classes, but I think it should be compatible with all of the Merkbor classes that are out there. But here are six to eight pirate themed classes. Starting with the Brute, a close combat pirate who relies on strength and toughness to overcome his enemies. Then we've got the Rep Skellion, a class you need a deck of cards to play, which is more of a trickster, more of a thief class. The Buccaneer, which is actually a wilderness survival class, so a bit like a pirate ranger. The Swashbuckler, which is also more of a close combat class, but they overcome the enemies with agility and style. The Zealot, which is kind of a cleric, which comes with useful prayers like healing, cursing, death wards, and so on. The Sorcerer, the Voodoo Sorcerer, which comes with a nasty necromantic magic. And these prayers and necromantic magic are exclusive to these two classes. For you also have the more general magic system that almost anyone could use, that land lovers could use, for example. In the form of ancient relics you can find and uh, just use as magic item and arcane rituals that work mostly like uh, the clean and unclean scrolls of Merc Borg. So every dawn roll d4 plus spirit to see how many times you can cast rituals. We've got d20 ocean themed rituals like Talasomanti D2 spirit creature lungs fill with sea water. They suffocate for D4 rounds, losing D4 HP each round, so you can summon water into the lungs of your enemies. Or the black spot, name a human you have met. They must test DR12 or die within D8 days. So, pretty powerful and setting appropriate stuff right here. We've also got our own mystical mishaps table on fumble table. The funny thing about this, uh, this can be really, really bad. Like nothing happens. Another the Kraken appears in D6 days. Or it can even be beneficial. Like everyone you can see recovers D6 HP. Including your enemies, but still could be nice. Or time stops, you experience a moment of absolute cosmic understanding and bliss. And you learn a new arcane ritual of your choice. So setting appropriate, interesting, magical mishap table right here. Let's get back to the classes. Apart from these six semi-serious classes, they actually feel more serious than most Merkborg classes which tend towards slapstick. While all of these certainly have their style, but they are more down to earth than, for example, the Fanged Deserter or the Gutterborn Scum. But you also get two classes, kind of optional classes, classes that the character can even gain later in their career, like the Haunted Soul. A possessed, infected, cursed, troubled, or undead individual, and you can roll a d6 what kind of undead curse your character suffers from. Or the tall tail. You can play as merfolk, as an aquatic mutant. You can play as a sentient animal, like a foul foal, a crocodile, a lucky parrot. So if you uh, want to play more of a Monkey Island style game instead of Pirates of the Caribbean, these two optional classes have you covered. We've got long equipment tables with pretty much everything a pirate needs. Clothes, 
Uh, armor is not as prevalent as in Merkborg. While armor is here and it does damage reduction same way as in Merkborg, metal isn't bulletproof. Black powder weapons ignore armor because pistols, blunderbusses and muskets are quite prevalent in a pirate setting. Armor is not as important as having fancy clothes that make you look amazing. And because there's no proper pirate without a fancy hat, we've got our own heads table. Wig, Bernadar, Cavalier, Bicone, Tricone, Fancy Tricone. Your basic adventuring gear, weapons, hospitality, like good rum for three silver, grog for only one silver. Range weapons, some of which have a reload time of two rounds where you need to use your action to reload the gun. There are some classes who can reduce this number to just one round. Or you could just wear a full brace of six pistols loaded and ready to shoot on your person so you don't have to worry about reload. Just shoot and drop Matrix style. You've got some special ammunition for the blowpipes like poison darts, sleeping darts, berserker darts. And we've got some grenades, smoke bombs, improvised grenades, clay grenades, iron grenades, fire pots and stink balls. So quite a variety of weapons here. Devil's Luck is the same as Omens, just renamed. And we've got huge background tables to flesh out your character. So we've got backgrounds, distinctive flaws, physical trademarks, idiosyncrasies, unfortunate incidents and conditions, and things of importance. So lots of tables to roll on or just use for inspiration to flesh out your character and make it unique. Now I mentioned naval combat, so we also got a huge selection of different ships, ranging from a raft and dinghy to the mighty ship of the line and man of war and also variations for all the monsters you might encounter at sea the ghost ship ship of bone and vessel from the deep and you can put this templates on most of the other ships so you can have a sloop ghost ship or man of war ghost ship then for the GM part, we have a huge bestiary, starting with some animals that sadly don't have any illustrations, but I think you can imagine a three-headed monkey or a rabbit jaguar. And after a few pages of this dark fauna, and dark flora even, carnivorous plants, electric corals, and a table, random table, a system to make your own enemies, which I always like. We've got a huge selection of setting appropriate monsters and enemies. So we've got a complete skeleton crew, zombies in many varieties. This reminds me a bit of Left 4 Dead. Ghosts of every variety and then uh, a few more special monsters. Some really huge creatures that have stats for naval combat because most likely you won't face an undead megalodon alone with just your party but with your whole pirate ship. Yeah, we've got some we've got a very brave stick man here <laughs> trying to harpoon the Kraken. Got giant sea turtle Davy Jones and finally the Leviathan. In the darkest abyss an antediluvian creature lurks waiting to devour the world. There are also some undead abominations of cannons. Marrow, Caronade, Bane of Barabos. As far as I understand it, these are self-moving animated 
undead constructs that happen to be cannons. And then we've got uh, the faction, the different factions and the stats for them, like naval officer, naval crew, naval ships, with the types of vessels the navy use, and the specialty. Navy ships have increased attack die by one size. Inquisition ships have increased hull by one tier, so extra armor. Necromancer ships are uh, ships of bones. Necromancers can spend a crew action to recover D8 of the ship's HP, self-healing ships. Vessels from the deep can spend 2d4 consecutive crew action to summon sharks, Davy Jones, Vale, the, Leviath the Leviathan. I think they can also go underwater to maneuver outside of cannon range. So these modifications should be the same as the ghost ship, ship of bone and vessel from the deep. Then we come to the random tables. And these random tables got you completely covered. Random ships you can encounter at sea and then potentially plunder for their cargo, complete with plot twists. Generator for derelict ships you can use as adventure sites. No pirate game is complete without buried treasure. D100 table of it. The one heart is one million pieces of eight got a generator for a treasure map, which I find very intriguing. It's complete with icons, complete with riddles for you ready to use. But sadly, there's no example treasure map ready to use, which I think would have been a great addition to this. We've got an uncharted island table so you can create more adventure sites, bigger adventure sites. Got an NPC generator and finally a quest generator to get your game started. So these random tables alone are already worth their weight in gold. I recommend you plunder them from this game for any other pirate themed game. There's a lot of stuff here, a lot of inspiration here to just use however you see fit. Last but not least in the rulebook is the example adventure, The Curse of Skeleton Point. This is a sandbox set on the island of Skeleton Point and the surrounding waters. And it's uh, complete with all the location plot hooks and the important NPCs and their motivations. So you can drop your players in here and then just see what happens. There are many points of interest in Skeleton Point. There are seven points of interest. Coral Town, Lighthouse, Carcass Beach, Skeleton Point, The Jungle, Death Head Swamp, the black coral reefs. So quite a lot of places to explore. This should keep your players busy for maybe six, seven sessions and could also be a base of operations to return to between adventures on other islands and high seas plundering and uncover more and more of the island's secrets. What this adventure doesn't have at all is sea travel though. No high seas adventure, no naval combat. As an introductory adventure to Pirate Borg, I would have loved to see some sea travel. Maybe instead of putting every point of interest on the same island, they could have spread them around on a small chain of islands, so the characters would have to travel with their pirate ship between these islands to reach the different points of interest, giving you some more opportunities for encounters on the high sea and for naval combat. Back of your book, you find 
lots of useful random tables like the before mentioned character generator sheet creature index general index the rules summary and finally the back cover all in all i find myself impressed by pirate borg what i first thought was just another theme glued to the Merkborg rule set is just the complete pirate deal. This is a very comprehensive game. And in my opinion, Pirateborg has grown beyond Merkborg. This is its own game. This is its own complete thing. And you will see adventures, more character classes, more material and more fan material made especially for pirate book mark my words this might just be the best pirate themed rpg out at the moment period at least if you like this rules light attitude heavy style of pirate Borg. if you are into monkey islands pirates of the caribbean or ale store music then i can wholeheartedly recommend you check out Pirate Borg. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and until next time.